Jeremy's going to talk about how to build a good, solid electric Effective, effective. That's the main key because there's a lot of, is anybody here from Muhlenberg County? Is anybody here from Tennessee other than Clay or Jody? Okay, one from, ten, two from Tennessee. All right, don't, don't get offended if I pick on you because I work in Tennessee also and I'll bring up some of the things I see in Tennessee that um, we might not see in Kentucky sometimes. Um, I hope everybody enjoyed Clint's presentation. I've been listening to Clint do these schools for probably eight or nine years now, and he always reminds me about how good of a neighbor I am because I've got eight different neighbors that, that join my property, and they've yet to have to pay for a single bit of fence, and I maintain every bit of it because they don't have livestock. But it just reminds me just how good of a neighbor I am. Um, so I love hearing Clint and would happily give up a little bit of time to let him get a few more questions in. So... To get started, this is going to be just a quick overview of how we can make electric fence or power fence effective. And there's a lot of fences that are built that are called electric fences that are not necessarily effective, but they just work part of the time. And some of that, um, I know our, uh, our <clears throat> engineer in the room may, may freak out a little bit, but if she were to drive just about 15 miles north of here in the Muhlenberg County, you would probably see some of those not very effective one-strand electrified barbed wire fences, and some of my neighboring farmers down the road a few miles, their cattle stay in just by imagination, or because they want to. Um, they're held in by imagination, as my wife says when she comes home from teaching school and sees a few calves out on the county road about once a week. So, to build an effective fence, we have to keep in mind there are some shortcuts that we can take and there's some shortcuts we cannot take. And we'll talk more about this in the field. If you have questions, keep them, keep them on hand and we'll have plenty of time outside to answer. We may even have some time um, under a shed to answer if we get caught in a rainstorm. So the first thing we have to remember with a power fence or an electric fence is it's a psychological barrier. The concept of, and we're talking primarily about high tensile for permanent fence, smooth, permanent, high tensile fence, electrified. But the first high tensile that came in this part of the country was brought in uh, by a company in California, then later adopted by a lot of the extension services in the 70s and 80s. And the concept was you could bring this smooth, fancy wire in, commonly used in New Zealand, 12 and a half gauge high tensile, put up 10 strands of banjo string tight, about that far apart, and no electricity and cattle would just bounce off of it all day long, right? Has everybody seen that design before? Maybe seen some old non-electrified high tensile? Well, that worked great for about two weeks until you had a little bit of slack, and then you could see cattle that would start to creep through it. Did Clint talk about creeping through? So cattle can creep through a smooth wire fence that has no psychological effect. What we eventually adopted and learned in the U.S. is we could take multiple strands of high tensile from the non-electrified design, cut about half of the wire out of it or more, electrify all of those, and then we have a psychological barrier. A lot of times that psychological barrier is strong or just as strong as the physical barrier, because before that's just a physical barrier. Those smooth wires were physically keeping cattle or livestock in. And I'll, I'll refer to cattle a lot. I'm a cattle producer, so if you do have small ruminant sheep and goats or alpacas, then um, don't don't take offense to me commonly mentioning cattle, uh, and don't be afraid to ask questions because there are some different considerations for small ruminants, sheep and goats, uh, and alpacas, I assume, and maybe you chime in, definitely, if there's something we need to do different on the alpaca side. So, electrifying the wires effectively created a great psychological barrier, and once that concept take took place, then we could start talking about the other parts of rotational grazing and actually controlling stock where we want them within the perimeter of the farm, which is a whole different conversation for something like grazing school, which you've never been to grazing school, then right now they're going on twice a year in Princeton and Versailles. Definitely um, take a look at coming to that because we get pretty deep into the, the temporary part of it. So if we can control all of these critters, plus many more, with a psychological barrier, electric fence, at every zoo that you can drive to within a 10 hour drive of Russellville, Kentucky, uh, or even further. But most of the zoos in the US, including Disney's Animal Kingdom, Louisville Zoo, Nashville Zoo, Knoxville Zoo, uh, every zoo in the territory I work in south, uses the same products, the same techniques and concepts 
that we can go to the farm store and pick up in most cases, uh, as long as we get the quality products. If they can do the same thing with these animals, then why in the world can we not control our cattle or sheep or goats or horses or alpacas with electric fence? Because if you've used electric fence in the past, and I'll raise my hand too, it has not always worked 100% of the time. And that's because I took some shortcuts. Once I started... A, once I started avoiding the shortcuts, then my effective rate went considerably up almost to 100%. But I guarantee you, the Louisville Zoo does not do things like use old pieces of water hose cut up in 16-inch pieces for insulators to keep the gorillas in the grill exhibit. Has anybody ever went to the Louisville Zoo and seen a green piece of water hose wrapped around a post? No. Now, some of my neighbors in Muhlenberg County, hope nobody was serious or joking about not being from Muhlenberg. So my neighbors, if you're not, I hope you're not here, but some of my fellow farmers in Muhlenberg would do things like that and then expect their fence to work all the time around the clock. Don't do that. Don't take shortcuts. And I joke about the garden hose cut up, but it has been done and you've seen your neighbors do it, especially you folks from Tennessee. I guarantee you, you've seen that before. Um, the Louisville Zoo, the Nashville Zoo, is not gonna take old court oil jugs and nail them to the tree to keep the giraffes in. If they did, they would not expect that psychological barrier to work around the clock. And these places with animals like this are using that psychological barrier as the primary barrier. That's the first barrier those animals experience before they get to the big physical barrier, the decorative fences, the big moats, um, the wrought iron fences that have a little bit better viewing um, spacing. So they're using a power fence to keep those animals off of that physical barrier. Now, sometimes we disguise that as, as grass with some hot grass and hot vines, but it does work. So the point to remember is we can build the fence right. We can control cattle behind a single strand of poly wire like in this picture. This is not a perimeter. For those of you that live in Logan County, this is not a fence that's recommended to keep cattle off of 431, right? We don't want to use poly wire to keep cattle off of 431 or 79. Um, so, if we can control with the psychological barrier one strand, then we can control it with a multi-strand barrier, cross-fencing, or a main perimeter. We have to build it right, don't take shortcuts. And by the way, this picture was taken in December, and that is Muhlenberg County Stockpile Fescue, and my neighbors a half mile down the road or so were feeding hay already at this time. So, isn't that wonderful? That's a whole different conversation. So, uh, basic questions. Clay touched on this. You've got to think about what are you keeping in, what are you keeping out. If it's small ruminants, then we're worried about keeping things out, for sure. Coyotes, neighbor's kids, neighbor's dogs, whatever, we're trying to keep them out. Is portability an issue? Do we ever want to expand from our perimeter fence with temporary fence to do some managed grazing? The main thing is power fence is a system. It's not just, I'm going to go buy the biggest fence charger I can buy and plug it up and it's gonna solve all my problems. No, we have to consider that there's three parts to it. The energizer, the hot box, the fencer, whatever you wanna call it. So the energizer, the insulated part of the system, so the insulators, the joint clamps, the cutoff switches, all the other plastics and components and the things that we can really cut corners on if we want to. And it's not a good idea, but that's where corners get cut. And then also the last part, which happens to be number two, for some reason I don't know, is the ground system. Now that is the number one part that corners are cut on around the world in 130 countries that the company I work for does business in is the ground system. That is the most overlooked. Now the, all three of those pieces have to work together to make a system. because That's what a system is. It's multiple parts. They all have to work together. The one part that I used to leave out because it never did really fit in is the lead out. So we can do everything else right. We can have a good energizer. We can have a great ground system. We can have all UV stabilized plastics that aren't going to fade to white and break and crack and fall apart in five years. But if we use an old piece of rusty wire to go from the energizer to our galvanized high tensile fence, then that's where our system is broke. So connect everything together in mind of it has to work as a system. If one part of that fails, the whole system fails. So when we're talking about energizers or fence boxes or hot boxes, whatever, always use low impedance technology if you're going to use polywire. 
We should use low impedance anyway because it's the it's been out for long enough. It's been proven. We know it will shock through weeds and grass better than the old solid states. But if you ever are going to use poly wire, do not use an energizer that has solid state listed on the box. The power stays on the wire just for a few thousandths of a second too long. Where a blade of grass touches that poly wire, it heats up and it'll melt your poly wire in two. And nobody wants melted poly wire because when it falls apart, the cattle go to the next grazing cell and they're eating somewhere you didn't want them to be. And that's the whole point about using electric for temporary internal is we control the dynamics, but if the poly wire burns in two, it kind of it messes that whole theory up. So always use low impedance with poly wire. Use low impedance with multi-strand high tensile permanent because when the grass and weeds grow up on it, the power doesn't stay on the wire but about three one thousandths of a second, so it doesn't stay on there long enough to ground the fence out. It'll slowly dehydrate the grass and weeds. Now, electric fence will not perform miracles. We can overpower to some extent, but we can't burn through we can't burn through blackberry briars and poke weeds and multiple roses. We have to do some bit of control on our fence. So what size, how do I compare? This is the $10 million question because we've got all these ratings on energizers and they vary from company to company, from uh, country to country, even from US to New Zealand, because you've got some that are rated mileage, some that are rated acreage, and some will say multi-wire, some will say single strand, some won't tell you, some will just say super shock and burn their hooves off hot. And then you can go to the, a lot of companies that, that, are, that are in New Zealand that are also marketing in the US, they'll have the exact same piece of equipment in New Zealand that'll say, It'll do 10 acres, but and it may be in hectares and acres, but it'll say 10 acres, and you bring that same piece of equipment to the U.S., and it'll say 100 acres. Well, I don't get it, because if you look at a regular acre, an acre is an acre is an acre, but why does the U.S. rate it bigger? Well, because there's no magic formula, and the marketing rules change a little bit in the U.S. because we want something that's always bigger and better, and the companies are trying to outdo each other in ratings. So what can we look at? Um, well, first, let's look at mileage and think about that from an accuracy standpoint. And just for this, we're going to talk about square miles, so a, or a square farm, because we could, have, we could have one acre of fence that's got about 88,000 feet on the perimeter, or we could have one acre that's got about eight or 900 feet on the perimeter. Because if I've got one acre that's one foot wide, then I'm one foot wide and 43,560 foot long, and one foot down there and 43,560 back to the back to the, the beginning, right? Does that make sense? So I can have one long rectangular acre that's got a lot bigger perimeter than a perfect square. So for this exercise, we're gonna talk about perfect squares. If I go out west of the other side of the Mississippi River and look at a section of ground, one section is 640 acres square. It's a mile by mile square. So if I drive my pickup truck around 640 acres and it's square, when I get back to the beginning, it's going to say four miles on the odometer. So an Energizer, a fence box that claims it can do four miles, theoretically, I should be able to take that to Missouri and fence in 640 acres with that. Does anybody think I can go buy an Energizer for $75 and go fence in 640 acres in Missouri? Probably not, even if it's good, clean, brand new, high tensile. It's not realistic. So that should raise a red flag. Maybe mileage ratings aren't exactly, maybe they're, we shouldn't take them verbatim. So go one step further. Go two steps further. What about an Energizer that's rated for 100 mile? Boy, that's a hot one. That's a, one of them 100 mile fence boxes. I hear that all the time. Really? It'll do 100 miles? Oh, yeah. So if I go out to Texas where... I can find a farm that's 25 miles this way and 25 miles and 20, you see where I'm going? 25 miles square. That's 100 miles driving around that ranch, as they would call it there. Well, that would be 400,000 acres. Can I go to the farm store and spend $150 on the fence box and it'll do 400,000 acres of fence? Now, this is real unarguable math. So what this means is do not take those mileage ratings verbatim, whether it doesn't matter what brand it says, even this brand. Don't take that mileage rating verbatim 100%. That is an estimate to be used within brand. So what I can say is within brand A, that that 
25 mile energizer is probably about as fourth as strong as the 100 mile. Will it do 100 miles? No, but the 100 mile is going to be four times more power. It's going to have four times as much horsepower it should. So don't compare across brands because there's no magic formula to figure out the mileage or acreage. What we can measure is joules, is a joule rating, and joules are nothing more than horsepower. Just like on a tractor, you pay for horsepower. The bigger the tractor, the more horsepower, the more money you pay for it. But just because I have a 100 horsepower tractor does not mean that I can necessarily pull a 20 foot bat wing bush hog around everywhere. Now if I'm bush hogging CRP ground that's as high as the ceiling, then that 100 horsepower tractor is probably not gonna pull a 20 foot bush hog through that. But if I'm bush hogging old fescue that's seeded out, no problem. So jewels are like horsepower. It gives me the capacity to do a little more. So now that we've got something to measure, we can measure joules with the machine. There's not there's several machines around the world, but it's not something we can measure with a hand tester or measure at home. But the companies are held liable for the joule ratings they give because they can be caught cheating. So joules are something to measure. Then we ought to be able to take the joules and let somebody convert that into something that's more common like miles. So one joule should do so many miles of fence, right? Some, surely the universities can come up with something like that. All these engineers then they ought to make some kind of magic formula and plug this energizer into a fancy box and it spit out so many miles of fence. Well, I think they've tried to do that and maybe they just tried to estimate it, but they can't get on the same page. And this could be because there is no answer to how many joules per mile. But there's some good estimates. Uh, you see the companies will give a joules per mile estimates around <coughs> two tenths of a joule per mile, one tenth of a joule. So the brands are fairly in line. Then you got NRCS in Tennessee, which has done quite a bit of work with uh, cost share and electric fencing, and they're they're a little more conservative. About a joule per mile, they're going to say. So you need a full joule per mile. Well, Missouri Extension, who's done a great job with electric fencing and research, and uh, Missouri NRCS and Extension actually created a, a book that Dr. Toich put in your, your handouts, um, and they're on the same page of a joule per mile, but then you got another company and California Extension and Minnesota Extension and They're back down to two. So what who knows we can't even get the government folks to agree on it So the answer it depends on How much fence how much weeds and grass I have on it? How many strands if I have all those strands tied together in parallel if it's all poly wire if it's all 12 and a half gauge high tensile if it's old rusty 14 gauge high tensile that is cobbled together or it just depends. So what you pay for are the horsepower, are the jewels. And depending on your specific situation, it is going to be different than mine or your neighbor's or your other neighbor. So buy what you need, buy what budget, buy what you budget for, and then keep in mind you want some extra capacity to go on top of it. Um, so technical terms, not gonna. I'm gonna kind of breeze through this. This is um, this will be in your your handout in your your three ring binders of fencing 101 that'll cover these uh, topics a little more in depth, and also in that orange book, which is an older version, it'll hit on those topics too. But some things to keep in mind um, with amps. A lot of our a lot of the things we we talk about with electric fence is very similar to concepts of hydraulics of water. So. The amps is going to be the current flow, and that's just like your gallons per minute, your flow rate in your water. Voltage is pressure. So if you have no pressure on your water, then that water just lays in that garden hose static. It doesn't move. If you don't have high voltage on your fence, the energy can't travel down the line. It doesn't push it down the line. So without pressure, your water sits there. Without voltage, your electricity just sits there. It doesn't get pushed down to shock the dog or the the goat or the alpaca or a neighbor's kid or whatever's touching it. So with electric fence though, we have to differentiate this from 110 volt plug in the wall power like that because we're talking milliamps of power, milliamps of current and high voltage. With that 110 volt plug in, we're low voltage and high amps. That will kill you dead, shock you. Electric fence is a very safe, effective shock, and it's not lethal because of the milliamps of power that's involved. The voltage is higher, but the amps is very low. Ohms, <clears throat> ohms can get us in trouble if we don't recognize how they affect the fence. I 
realistically on my wire, on my poly wire, on my steel permanent high tensile wire that's electrified, I want zero ohms of resistance. I want nothing to impede that electricity from flowing through that material to the other end. It's just like a water pipe. Old galvanized water pipes will get corrosion inside of them and crud and crumb, uh, rust and scale built up, and that slows down the water flow. Rusty corroded connections can slow down the electricity flow on fence as well. Also, smaller diameter wire. The ohms of resistance increases. I want zero. As I go higher, it's less conductive. Now, also, when something lays on the fence and touches it, I want that to have a lot of resistance. I want a tree limb to have thousands of ohms of resistance because I don't want the electricity flowing down that tree limb to the ground. Now, a T-post would have probably in the double digits ohms, and a tree limb would have in the thousands of ohms. With my insulators, guess what? I want my insulators to have high resistance. I don't want my electricity to travel through my insulating material and then short out on the post. But on my fence wire, I want as close to zero as I can get. We can't get to zero, but we can get pretty dang close. We can get closer than we think just by making some multiple wires hot. Um, the, the scary part to this is I can take my fence tester, which is a great management tool to have. You can get some that will tell you the fault direction and just some that read plain voltage. But I can take my fence tester, and I can test a fence with nothing, nothing on it, no grass on it, no cattle touching it, and I can show 5,000 volts on my poly wire, for example. I can show 5,000 volts on that poly wire, but I can stand there and I can watch a calf walk right under it and drag it across his back and never get shocked. And I think, what in the world's going on? To test the fence, 5,000 volts. Should be, calf should be getting shocked, but I can have corroded loose connections. I can reduce the flow, but not the voltage, until the fence is loaded. So I can have a good voltage reading with an ineffective fence, and the reason is, when that calf touches the fence, guess what that calf is walking on? Four ground rods. The calf is shorting the fence out, to a capacity that the electricity can't flow through and get shocked because I've got some old junky poly wire that's six strands and only two strands are intact because the other four are broken. Now I'm trying to carry my electricity through two little strands. It'll read good with that tester, but when I short it or load it, my voltage just bottoms out because of the resistance. Or if it's on steel wire, I've got a bunch of old rusty corroded connections where I've just kind of wrapped the wire around there two or three times and it's rusted and it's not getting a good contact, when the fence gets loaded, the electricity doesn't travel through that loose, rusty wrap, and the shock is not effective. That's why we wouldn't use crimps or joint clamps and class three galvanized wire. Not the little 14 gauge junk that comes on a spool that rusts after a year of setting out in the sun and the rain and ambient atmospheric conditions. Jules, it's one watt for one second, which means nothing to me or anybody else in the room because I can't measure it with a hand tester, but joules are the horsepower of the fence. That is our capacity. That's where the pain comes from when the animal gets shocked. Um, to give you an example, right now the, the, the most powerful energizer in the world is 100 stored joules. That's the capacity it has to store 100 joules and the smaller ones will be anywhere from one to two tenths of a joule, which is great for a, a couple acre lot in the backyard with some show calves or something like that. So there's your range, from a couple tenths up to 100 joules. Um, power supply options, moral of this story, always use 110 volt power if you can. You get a lot more bang for the buck. If you have $300 budgeted for your electric fence on your NRCS cost share, your CAPE cost share, or just your personal out of your own pocket program, farm project, if you have $300 budgeted and you can use a 110 volt plug in the wall, then use a 110 volt plug in the wall. Because if you spend that $300 on a solar, and solar technology has come a long way in the last five years, but if you spend that $300 on a solar, then you've got about one fourth of the power, one fourth or more or less of the joules than you could with a 110 volt. Now, if you have to use a solar because of your location, consider using a larger solar that has some type of either a big gel cell battery it runs off of and a solar panel, or some of the newer technology solars that run off of a um, 
self-contained gel cell battery that has some type of management software built into the module of it to where it can increase the charging capacity according to the sunlight and the power demand. Um, but solar is always going to be the most expensive option per joule. If you have to go with solar, then keep in mind you're going to have to budget more money to cover the same amount. So how does it work? How does the animal get shocked? Um, am I at 45 or at, at the hour, Chris? I'm at 45 or the hour? Uh, What's my time slot? So how does the animal get shocked? Um, this is an all-hot system. Cow walks up to the fence, touches the cow with her nose. Okay. The electricity goes down through her body, down through her feet, which she walks upon the soil, and transfers back through the soil all the way back to... Back again? Come back here. Well, you can tell some more stories. So all the way back to our ground system, then it completes a circuit to the energizer. That's how an all-hot system works. We have to rely on the soil and the ground system. The alternative to that is a hot ground system. A true hot ground system consists of multiple strands. One or more of those strands will be grounded. Now, how does that strand or strands get grounded? It has to be connected to the ground rods that the energizer is actually connected to. So guess what that means? Every time you go under a gateway, you go under a gateway with your hot wire and your ground wire. You trace it all the way back to the beginning to these ground rods that is connected to the energizer. So I go ground wire on the fence, back to the ground rods, and those ground rods connect to the energizer. Every gateway, every time the fence is broke, that ground wire has to be jumped around the corner and connected back in a loop. Now, I have seen going on maybe four at this point, four true hot ground systems in Kentucky, Tennessee, parts of Georgia, Alabama, and Indiana. I have seen four true ground systems in the last 13 years of doing this. Because a lot of people will say, well, it's a hot ground system. I've got seven strands and two of them are hot and the other, the other five strands are grounded. They are. Oh, yeah, I've got some ground rods just driven randomly out there. Why'd you do that? Well, I don't know. That's, a, that's what the neighbor said to do with the coffee shop or the gas station. That's not a true hot ground system. If you go out west and do that, then your sheep and goats and cattle will be on your neighbor's property because that is not a true hot ground system. We have to do this right in the, the arid west United States and most of Australia for that matter too. So we have to build it like this in certain areas. I can get away without doing this in Kentucky and Tennessee and some of the southeast because our soils are conductive enough, I'll still get some current through the ground. But if you're going to go through all the trouble of building a hot ground system, then do it right. But if you do it like this, remember, keep in mind, unless you're talking about, and not all jokes aside, alpacas or llamas or wool sheep, then those animals do need a sure enough hot ground where they touch both at the same time and get an instant shock because it's connected to the energizer. We don't have to do this in Kentucky or Tennessee because of our soil composition. And if we use a proper ground system, even in dry times, a proper ground system will still carry the shock. And if I have a fence and it has multiple wires on it, then I'm going to have every single strand of that wire electrified. If it is sitting there not electrified and it's not hooked up like this, which is a proper ground system, then I have wasted my time and money and resources and I've got a bunch of metal out there that's not doing any good at all because the cattle are still going to touch it and not get shocked and it's not going to help on my ground. More power, more wire carries more power for longer distances. And that is coming up here just a second real quick just to cover something that's very important. So this grounding is so important. You say it's the most overlooked in 130 countries. So what is the rule? And this is not Gallagher. This is not Jeremy McGill. This is almost every extension service in the United States and NRCS in every state spec agrees on the, the general rule that the, the recommendation is the minimum of three ground rods, six foot deep, 10 foot apart. That's the minimum. It's not against the law to add six ground rods or 10. 
the bigger the energizer, the more ground rods we have to add. And there's some equations in your fencing 101 manual that'll tell you how to size your ground system according to your joules, your horsepower of your energizer. So that's the recommendation. Galvanized. Galvanized rods. Galvanized wire. And everybody, who wants to... Is there any electricians in the room? Okay. Do, we, do I ever want to join copper with another metal without putting your fancy salves and things on there? No. You heard it from the electrician. Everybody wants the electricians involved with their electric fence, which most of the time, no offense, it's not a good idea to have your electrician do anything with your electric fence because it's a different concept unless your electrician is an agriculturist themselves. But the electrician says don't join copper and galvanize together ever. That's because copper is so good of a conductor, it hates other metals. It hates other metals. Hates, 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 hates. If I join copper and galvanize together and pass electricity through it, electrolysis occurs because two dissimilar metals that are electrified will corrode. And I can put these fancy bridges, and this man's probably got some creams I can put on there to keep it from corroding as fast. But the easy thing is just don't use copper. Don't use copper, because if I mix copper and galvanize, it will corrode. If I have corrosion, then I've got problems. I can't carry my flow, and electricity flows through the ground system. That's how the cow gets shot. So galvanized rods, galvanized wire, and use galvanized or brass clamps. Brass clamps are okay. Keep it all the same material, and I won't have any corrosion. I have seen energizer terminals burnt in two from people putting a copper wire in their galvanized energizer terminal and chucking it up, then they wonder why it burns in two after three years. Two different metals with electricity passing through it will corrode. Yep. The exception to the rule is if you're in Tennessee. You're, you have an extension manual in Tennessee that is uh, Tennessee fencing. It was written in 1972, I think. And it actually says you can use galvanized, ground, galvanized wire and copper ground rods. I don't know what they do different in Tennessee, but there's got to be something because their extension service recommends it. But in this case in Kentucky, um, NRCS and UK does not recommend that. So keep everything galvanized. Do, on that note, do not use the ground for your house or your tool shed for your electric fence. Two different things. If... Do I have to have that ground rod on my tool shed to make that power meter work and the lights come on? How many old homesteads and farm shops and tool sheds in Logan County have had the copper ground wire corroded off of it for the past 15 or 20 years? Or the weed eaters finally knocked it into or the lawnmower deck and the lights still come on? That ground rod on the electrical service is there for safety. Is that correct? It is there for safety. The ground rods plural, that means three or more, ground rods on the electric fence is there for function. If I hit that ground wire with my lawnmower, then my electric fence no longer works properly. Two different things. Keep them separated. Keep them separated 30 to 50 foot apart. We put a ton of money into research in New Zealand and sponsored several PhD students to study this to get that what that magic number was, and it's about 30 to 50 feet separation between my utility ground and my electric fence ground. We don't want those two things confused. We don't want those signals confused. So stay away from it. The research has been done. Don't mix the two together. The better the ground system I have, the better the antenna I can reach up further across the farm and pick up a signal of a cow touching the fence, just like I, with the dish network, I can reach all the way across the world with the satellites lined up right and watch a boxing match in some foreign country. Um, with rabbit ears, I can just reach maybe Bowling Green WBKO 13 from here um, before everything went digital. I could take my rabbit ears and put some aluminum foil on it, and we could pick up the Nashville stations from Greenville a little bit better. Well, rabbit ears is like using a galvanized piece or a real rusty piece of rebar. That's about the kind of signal I can pick up, not very far. Now, we all know you can wrap the aluminum foil in the rabbit ears and get a little better signal. Well, that's when somebody just takes and they shine some of the rust off of that rebar before they put their hose clamp on there. It's still not a very good antenna compared to a side to dish network. <coughs> Protect your investment. Lead out. Um, use at least the same size wire as your fence wire is. Don't use a real small lead out and try to lead out into a big 12 and a half gauge wire fence. So resistance. Here we are back to the resistance part. This is... The, a very 
If you've got a multi-strand high tensile fence right now, this is a, a very, very cheap because as farmers, we like things that are cheap. This is a very cheap thing we can do to improve the performance of our fence if we have multiple strands that are not all electrified. Also, that galvanized ground rod thing is pretty cheap too because we can go back and add two more ground rods and have three for less than 25, 30 bucks and have a more effective fence. So, resistance, 12 and a half gauge wires, about 56 ohms per mile. If we look at the 16 gauge stuff, it's about 160 ohms per mile. So, that means that my high tensile is about three times more conductive than the little 16, 14, or 17 gauge wire that I buy that should be used as temporary fence. And it shouldn't even be used as that because it rusts the bag because it's class one galvanized. High tensile is more conductive. Aluminum is more conductive than high tensile steel, but aluminum is not real conducive to permanent fence because it just keeps stretching and stretching and stretching. It doesn't like other metals either and it'll burn in two sometimes. It's very conductive. So with high tensile, one strand is 56 ohms per mile. How many ohms per mile do we want our wire to be? We want no resistance. We want zero ohms. Well, guess what happens if I join two strands of high tensile together in parallel? Look at that number. It's 28. Parallel means at that end of the fence or that brace post, it's jumped up and down. And at this end of the pool where I terminate it, it's jumped up and down. Look at my number. Is 28 smaller than 56? Are we trying to get to zero? Yes. Are we getting closer to zero? Yes. I've just built a more conductive fence by adding a second strand. So what if we take a four strand fence? I've got four strand of fence. Two of them are hot. Two of them are just sitting there holding the earth together because that's what the guy at the copy shop said to do. Oh, just electrify two strands of it. That'd be good enough. If I electrify those other two strands, I now have 14 ohms per mile of resistance for that whole system because they're joined in parallel at that end and this end. Or at that corner and this corner and over here at this corner. And every time I break the fence, I jump them up and down, all four strands in parallel at both ends. The energizer looks at that like one great big strand of wire, not four little bitty ones that are just connected at one end. I got to connect it down there too. It looks at it like one great big strand. More wire carries more power for longer distances. Power travels around the circumference of that wire. When I increase the surface area by jumping those multiple wires together, I've increased the conductivity of my fence. Yes, sir. Yes, if you are doing a true hot ground return system, which means every time you go under a gateway, those two wires have to be jumped together and go into that gateway too, an underground cable, or it's not a true hot ground system. If it's not a true hot ground system, then cut the cord on all those ground rods that are driven randomly around the farm and make them all hot and you're at a more conductive fence. And since we still live in Kentucky or Tennessee, the soil's conductive enough to shock the animal in the middle of the August drought. So, you don't have to have any return wire. There is no need for a return wire on electric fence. In in yes, yeah. In, in anywhere in the anywhere in the eastern U.S., unless you have alpacas or something hairy or hair sheep or wool sheep, where you want to have that hot wire and ground wire together when they touch them both at the same time, it's a shock. But otherwise, we don't need to have a return wire. What, what can happen if you put the return wire? Thank you. I forgot all about that. If I have a true hot ground system, or if I have a system that is just hot wires and some alternating non-hot wires with maybe a ground rod or two driven around, if I go through a, a trees and a tree limb falls and mashes two of those wires together, I'd might on a true hot system, true hot ground, I'd might as well walked up the energizer and stuck a screwdriver across the hot. I'm a dead short. I'm done. Now I can shock the fire out of a of a wool sheep that touches both of those strands together. But if both of those strands get together on their own by a tree limb, I'm history. If I've got an all hot system that's five strands or four strands or six like we built at Mr. Jeff's place, 
then I get a tree limb fall. It's probably not going to mash all six of them to the ground on a flexible system. So I've just got a, a, some resistance on that tree limb, which is super high. I'm not losing anything overnight if two or three strands mash together. So that's, I hope that answers your question. But if you've got, the point to this is if you have multiple strand fence that already exist and it was put up and not all of them were hot and the other ones are just there and you don't go, to, if you had it custom built, when you go to your gateway and you see one wire that connects from one side of the gate to the other, that means that the hot is only connected. That that person, that contractor did not run a ground so it's not a true hot ground system. You can go and insulate those other wires and have a tremendously more conductive fence, which means you can carry power longer distances a lot easier. But you gotta hook it in parallel, which can so, be done. So you'll actually be able to pick up the bullet that way? By default, you, oh, yeah, uh, yes, you can pick up some voltage on the neutral wires because you have power run in parallel. You can take a fence tester and check, and you may have 8,000 on this hot and 8,000 on this hot, and your fence tester may say you've got 2,000 on that neutral wire, especially if it's not grounded with a ground rod, just randomly driven. So you'll have inductive voltage on those wires. Inductive voltage happens, and you've got stuff running parallel with each other. As a matter of fact, you run a multi-strand fence parallel under a high voltage transmission line, be careful because you can pick up real inductive voltage. I don't know if anything's been lethal, but it can be, it can be very uh, uncomfortable. I've been shocked before by a five-strand fence with no energizer hooked to it. Not, no energizer anywhere, but um, running parallel for a short distance under high voltage lines that were however many feet high, you can get it, you can get inductive voltage and you can feel a constant tingle. Because it's not alternating like the electric fence, it's constant just like that wall. So, yep. So that, that's a safety standpoint. Try to cross perpendicular at an angle if you can. Save some money out of that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, just to finish up, um, don't take shortcuts, don't mix metals, don't use house wire. Nobody in Kentucky would do that. That's a Tennessee thing where they use Romex cable on their electric fence because they can't read the voltage reading that says 600 volts uh, and they try to put 6,000 to it. But anyway, it's a system. Don't take shortcuts. Don't, you, don't do this. It, there is an electric fence somewhere in there potentially. Do some maintenance. It can dehydrate. A large energizer will dehydrate the water out of grass in the springtime to an extent, but you can't let honeysuckles grow up in it. Now, how effective is this? Now, you saved... 15 cents on an insulator with that thing, but it doesn't work out real well when it slips out from under the staple after 10 years, or the steeple, depending on what part of the state you're in. So stay away from these things. They do not meet the tracking distance requirements. That is extremely important on insulators. There is a mathematical equation that's very specific that is proven and researched over and over and over again. Electricity can travel about four millimeters per thousand volts. So for every thousand volts in the energizer, it travel about four millimeters around the surface of something. So if you put that in, put it in, in non-metric, I need about an inch and a quarter of a tracking distance along the surface of the insulator on an 8,000 volt system. So if I don't have an inch and a quarter of tracking distance from here to where my post is that does not meet the tracking distance requirements, dirt and bird manure and dust, that electricity will flow along that and short out on the post over time. Now, air gap is about half that. So go about 0.625 of an inch of an air gap that it can travel through the air for 8,000 volts. But tracking distance is very important. Um, those little tube things will get you in trouble. We'll talk about that later. Um, there's a, here's a, here's a, a man, got rid of those tubes and because it shorted out, then he put a, a cheaper pinlock insulator there and the brittle plastic, the wire cut through it, so it, he really didn't help himself any. And I'll, I'll close with that picture right there. Should we expect that fence to be effective? No. No, and nobody would ever guess that was on the University of Kentucky Extension Research Farm either. Would it? So we'll have plenty of time in the in the field for questions, uh, just a little teaser. There's some technology out there. Right now I can take this phone and I can check the, the voltage on my product manager's fence that lives in Hamilton, New Zealand, and I can check the voltage on our fence in 
um, Riverside, Missouri that's running around our office right now with my phone. I can also get alerts on it. And... If I put monitors around, it'll, it'll tell me what the Energizer's doing and, and the monitors. We can talk about that later, but it'll do some pretty neat things. And also, what's the future hold? Well, this is here now, um, and, a, and we'll have a short presentation on that here in a minute. But this is a cow wearing a collar that is connected to the GPS, that is connected to another system that I have went to my iPad or iPhone, and I have drawn where I want those cattle to be grazing. And when that cattle gets close to my fence, the cattle gets shocked. This is real, it's here, it's developed, it's done. Um, big, big deal, big, big deal out west and in certain areas that we never have been able to fence before, like some of these resources in the mountains with all this grass that can't be grazed. Um, NRCS has spent millions and millions and millions of dollars fencing off large rivers and streams. Those millions of dollars could have been about a fourth with virtual fencing. So, and we'll, that's going to be coming up here in a minute. So, we'll have plenty of time and feel for questions. Let's thank Jeremy.